Okay. <clears throat> You're on video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, continuing with uh, the coverage of uh, uh, spectral methods from last time, um, I'm going to do a quick um, mop up of uh, of uh, Monday's material because there's a couple things that got messed up. Um, but also, I think since, since it was a very long, drawn out thing, um, so that's easily easy, easy to get lost in um, a uh, recap that doesn't include like the um, you know, the crazy, nasty steps might be helpful to understand the, uh, to have a better, have a good understanding of the big picture. Um, so, Spaced uh, grid points um, on the interval zero to two pi. Okay. Um, on J going from one one to n. So really, what I'm doing is leaving out the left boundary x equals zero, including the right boundary x equals two pi, um, which we only need one boundary because it's periodic anyway. Um, and uj was uh, written as a sum, a linear combination of its own values times this delta function, a discrete delta function. So delta j is 0 if j is not equal to 0. If j equals 0, but we'll also exclude this definition is j 0 or non 0 mod n, meaning that if j is a multiple, an integer multiple of capital N, then it's equivalent it equals 0 mod n, or it's congruent to 0, is how they often say it. Um, in that case, it's equal uh, to 1. And that's something I actually needed to use uh, later on in what I did. Um, and uh, overlooked it. Um, so, and the general idea last time was u prime at this point j is therefore approximated by a similar sum or in the same coefficients, the u values, and then pj prime evaluated at this point, nj minus xm, where pj of x is um, the band-limited interpolance of this delta function. Uh, so in other words, it agrees with the delta function at all the grid points. It's equal to 1 <coughs> at, 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 uh, plus on the boundary, 0 at all the points in the interior. Um, so the idea is, if our function is represented this way and we want its derivative, well, we take the derivative of a linear combination. This is um, a function that's only defined 
at those grid points. So we fit a function to it that's equal at the grid points, take a derivative of that instead, which is actually the same approach I'll use a little later today for the non-periodic case. Um, so, so you want a derivative, express your function as a combination of other functions, take the derivatives of those. And that's um, what happened here. Um, and Um, so pj of x was written, this is the part that where things went awry, 4a series, um, actually it's a truncated 4a series, really it's a 4a interpolant. the i k x times um, these are the Fourier coefficients um, of the uh, uh, delta function um, and that is defined this way delta k hat is a sum h equals j equals so h times sum j equals 1 to n e to the minus i k x j. Um, times delta j. Um, now, so one thing that I glossed over was that, or kind of messed up here, was that j goes from 1 to n. Um, now, this delta function, that's equal to 0 for all values of j considered, except which one? If you go to the definition, because um, you could say j equals 0 except for one thing. J equals zero is not part of the sum. J is only going from one to n. So, um, so failing that, which value of J does produce something non-zero here? Oh wait, non-zero. The first. Yeah. Um, not quite. Because of this. Um, so j is equal to something mod n if um, basically if, if j minus this, whatever you have here, is a multiple of n. So in other words, if j itself is a multiple of n, then this applies. So what do we have here? So which value of j is going to give us something? J equals n. Yes, j equals n. But doesn't there have to be something like a multiple of n? Well, it is multiple of n. N is multiple of n. Yeah. One. So that works. Yeah, yeah, it could be any multiple of n. And, uh, so even if it's n itself, any number is a multiple of itself. Um, so when j is equal to n, so if I'll, I'll just plug in j equal n. So if h e to the minus i k x x n, but x j is defined over here to be n times h. But what is n times h? Yeah. 
So it's 2 pi. Well, this is the same as cosine 2k pi plus i sine 2k pi, which is what? Yeah, because this is 1, and that's 0. So it's just h. Now, that is what I wrote down last time, but it's equals h. But my explanation of why it's h on Monday was flawed, because I said, oh, it's plug in j equals 0. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> so. <clears throat> OK. So then h is what gets uh, filled in there. Um, so, so really, we're able to write down pj of x as h over 2 pi sum over these k values, which I'm too lazy to write, e to the i k x. Um, and that's where all the trig happened, which I'm not going to delve into again, um, except um, so the, except for the final result. So, so a closed form representation of this was found using the loss of trig identities, and it was h over 2 pi sine pi x over h tangent x over 2. And what was needed here was a derivative of that. So I took the derivative of that the old-fashioned way. Um, you know, plugged in these points. X, uh, that's tangent x over x two. over two. two. Yeah. Um, and so there was one other issue that popped up after I'd done all the rest of that, uh, which I didn't have a clear answer for at the time, um, because. What ends up happening is pj prime at xj minus xm turned out to be, so in order to you compute the derivative of all this, you plug that in, um, and you get um, minus 1 to the j minus m um, cotangent of j minus m h over 2. So those turn out to be the coefficients. So when I described what matrix you multiply u by to get the derivative, all the matrix entries had this form. Um, and I had written down, okay, this is what the matrix looks like, how the entries along each diagonal were the same and all that. Um, and there was one uh, technical difficulty, and that was this is only well defined if uh, j is not equal to m, because uh, cotangent has a vertical asymptote at 0. So we can't use that there. Um, and what I'd kind of fudged last time was saying it, simply saying if this equals 0, if j equals m. And I had no justification for that whatsoever. And, and it really bugged me. So. After you all left, um, I looked into it. I actually wrote some MATLAB code. I wrote a function for the band limited interpolant BLI of P. So I called it blip uh, dot M. Um, and I graphed it. Um, well, I, well, the deriv derivative of it I graphed. So I want to see, like, is this really going to 0? Is PJ prime of 0 really 0? And based on the graph I was seeing, well, yeah, it is. Um, the other thing I did today on, on paper was I, because I took a derivative of this in class, um, and what happens there is if I let x equal 0, you get 0 over 0. So what do you do in that case to find out what the value really is? Yes, Lobital's rule. 
And if I apply a little, little bit, if I take a derivative of this, which is undefined at x equals zero, and then I apply L'Hopital's rule to that, so I have to take a derivative again, um, you really do get zero. So, um, so it all worked out. Um, they're just it wasn't really justified based on what I had in my notes. Um, okay, so, so that's why the diagonal entries of your differentiation matrix um, are uh, uh, zero. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's weird. Okay. Um, what's kind of weird, though, is um, all of this that was done here to come up with a approximation of the first derivative um, can be applied for a second derivative also. The only thing that would be different is <clears throat> once I got to this point, um, I would just take the second derivative of this and evaluate that at xj minus xm. Um, and uh, so it turns out you actually do get something on the diagonal um, uh, in that case. So um, okay. So excuse me. The um, So that was our first look at every time my screen goes dark and when I come back, I always find a mouse is hovering directly over the stop button. So I was afraid that I'll stop the recording, but it's still going. Um, so this is the first look at differentiation matrices um, that u prime at x1, u prime at x2, and so forth, down to u prime at xn is approximated by a differentiation matrix times the values of u. And the matrix that was arrived at was zeros on the diagonal, and then these expressions involving uh, cotangent on the uh, off diagonal. So all the entries on this diagonal are the same, equal to one half cotangent uh, h over two, um, and then the next diagonal minus one half cotangent of 2h over 2 and so forth. And then this would continue if I went to other diagonals to be plus 1 half cotangent 3h over 2. So it would be a full matrix. Um, and then the same thing happening on below the diagonal but with the opposite sign. Um, so and like I said last time, it's a topless matrix, meaning the entries along any diagonal are all the same. Um, so, so this is very different from the matrix that we saw, like for, like for instance, using the center difference that would have zeros on the diagonal also, but it would have um, 1 over 2h up here, and then minus 1 over 2h um, uh, uh, down there. So, um, and then zero everywhere else. But that's an approximation of derivative using only three points. The more points I use to approximate the derivative, the more entries I would have out here. So what we're seeing here is the extreme case, where you use all the available points to approximate the derivative. These are, this indicates a linear combination of them that you take. If you have periodic boundary conditions, and if instead you want the second derivative, like for example, if you're solving Poisson's equation, same 
same idea, just having the appropriate matrix, and you get by taking the second derivative of your band limited interpolants of your delta function. So, so that matrix on the diagonal, um, your diagonal matrix are kind of strange. Minus pi squared over 3h minus 1, 6. Um, although, I seem to recall last time in the class there was, there might have been a typo here in the notes, I don't remember if it got fixed. So I may need to check on that. Um, and then, down the off diagonals, like 1 half plus secant plus 2 squared, h over 2, and then minus 1 half plus secant squared, 2h over 2, and so forth. And then similar over here, But one big difference with a second derivative as opposed to a first derivative, this matrix is skew symmetric. So here, these entries that are like basically mirror images of each other, they're negatives of each other. So this matrix is equal to minus its own transpose. Um, so this is called skew symmetric. In fact, any skew symmetric matrix necessarily has a zero diagonal. Whereas for the second derivative, it is symmetric. These entries are equal that are on opposite sides of a diagonal. Um, but you still have the, as you go through the diagonals, you still have the alternating signs, the positive negative, then positive negative, etc. Uh, and, they're, and they're both toplets. Okay. Um, now, one um, drawback here of using these differentiation matrices, well, um, the good part about them, extremely accurate because they're using all the points available to each derivative. Um, so much more accurate than the finite differences, uh, for instance. Um, but con is, compared to finite differences, not sufficient because you just look at the matrix vector product. In finite differences, you have a matrix that only has a few, a handful of non-zero entries per row. So that matrix vector product takes only order n operations. These matrices, practically every entry is non-zero. Um, so a matrix vector product takes order n squared operations versus order n for finite difference. So if you use these matrices directly, your matrix vector product is much more expensive. <clears throat> there is a workaround, though. You don't have to do this matrix vector product directly. You can use Fourier series, since everything I'm doing is Fourier series based anyway. You can use the FFT, which is order n, n log n operations. So it says log to base 2. Um, so that is a huge improvement over n squared. Um, still not as good as order n, really like that. But, um, but at the same time, having that greater accuracy um, can really make it worthwhile. Now, I'm going to do an example that shows how nice having uh, this Fourier series is for solving uh, PDEs either highly accurately or 
at least, or maybe even exactly in some cases. All right, so uh, this is a 2D example. So Poisson's equation on a rectangle, or well, square. Uh, so 0 to 2 pi in x, 0 to 2 pi in y. Um, so we have minus the Laplacian of u. So it's minus uxx plus uyy is equal to f. Um, and u is 2 pi periodic. in both variables. <clears throat> so, we get a Fourier series for f. So f x y is a sum over all pairs of integers, so k and l, both going from minus infinity to infinity. Um, and we get e to the i k x plus i l y. So that's what 2D Fourier series looks like. So we said we had the e to the i k x e v i k x before, but now we multiply by a similar factor for y. And then we have Fourier coefficients that have two indices now because we're in 2D. Um, and if we were to do this like in MATLAB, for instance, there are functions that carry out a two-dimensional fast Fourier transform, FFT. So these are easy to get. <clears throat> okay. Um, In MATLAB? Yes. But yeah, it's FFT2 is a function that gives you everything. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, well, at some, soon we'll be getting into MATLAB stuff, I promise. <laughs> so, well, maybe some of you wanted to put that off as long as possible. Um, and uh, I'll have more to say about that. Um, and then you represents similarly. It's just that the Fourier coefficients for u are unknown at this point. Now, what's nice about this is um, it's very easy to go from a Fourier series for u to a Fourier series from a Laplacian of u. So I'll take a Laplacian of both sides, or minus a Laplacian. So I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to x twice, also with respect to y twice add them together. So these are constants, the Fourier coefficients of u. So what's, if I take the second derivative of this with respect to x, what am I going to get? Yeah, yeah, so we're going to multiply this by um, so because of the i k x, we're going to get minus k squared, but we have a minus out here, so that'll give us a plus. Okay. But then we also take a second with respect to y, so what will that give us? L, L squared. And we're adding those. So it's k squared plus L squared e to the i k x 
plus Ly u hat kl. Okay, so Vesser minus Laplacian. Now that is the left side of our PDE. And then the right side is right here. So all we got to do now is match these up. Um, so in both cases of the Fourier series, we have an EVI kx, kx plus ly. So we just, we just got to match up term by term, which we can do because these functions, the EVI kx plus ly, they're literally independent. So what that means is these functions are equal if and only if each individual term in the summation is equal. Um, so, if I, now these they have in common, so we forget about those. Effectively, they, I know I shouldn't say this, Sarah, but yeah, they cancel out. <laughs> so, but I get to say that. So, okay. yeah, uh, I, I hope so. Sometimes it's questionable. Um, so we look at everything else. So, so the rest of what we have here, k plus l, k squared plus l squared, u hat k l, is equal to f hat k l. Um, so, so that is, and this is my unknown. So I just divide. So u hat k l is equal to f hat k l over k squared plus l squared. So right there, I have my solution. So all I had to do, if I were to write down like step by step, literally, what has to be done. Take the fast Fourier transform of f, so you get the f hat kl out of that. Okay. Then divide by each of those coefficients by the appropriate sum of squares, and that gives me u hat kl. And then, how do I go, if I have a Fourier series coefficients of a function I want, how do I go back to it being a function of x and y? What's, what, what do we yeah, call that? Transform. Yes, so inverse FFT, and in the MATLAB that's IFFT for 1D, or IFFT2 for 2D, um, and that gives me u of xy, at least at your grid points. Um, so you have your solution as a function of x and y, and that's it. So that's why I love spectral methods. It's bang, 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 done. Um, and with very high accuracy, too. Like, now, we would have to truncate these Fourier series at some point, um, but like, what if f is band-limited, for instance? Like, so within a certain range of frequencies, k and l, that f hat, f hat kl is zero outside of that range. My numerical solution would actually be the exact solution, except for a little bit of round off. Now, there is one sticky point, though. When can I not do this? Mm -hmm. So for which values of k and l would that happen? What? Yeah, because well, yeah, this square, the sum of squares is non negative. Mm -hmm. So only if k and l are both zero can I not do it. So I need. Well, what's a k and l represent again? What? Um, where are the instructions? Oh, um, well, so my basis functions are indexed by k and l. So they're just constants. They're yeah, yeah. They're yeah, but their parameters are range through all the integers. So as long as one of these is non zero, then I can do this. <clears throat> now, this exposes a potential problem with this procedure. Because 
what about the case where k and l are both zero? So like in this Fourier series, if I set k and l both to zero, then I have this coefficient here, this f hat zero, zero. So there's nothing here, it's just one. So I have a constant term. Um, but it turns out that's not a problem because when I take u and um, take the negative Laplacian of it, if I have, in my Fourier series, if I have k and l both being zero, that is a constant here. What happens to it when I take Laplacian? What is the, what would the Laplacian of a constant be? Yeah, zero. Because uh, I'm taking a derivative. So, uh, yeah, so in other words, it's killed many times over. Um, so it doesn't even get past the first derivative, let alone the second. So what that means is um, there's no way I'm going to I'm going to get a constant on the right side. Um, because if there's no periodic function you can take a derivative of, or, or a Laplacian of, and get a constant. It just can't happen. So in other words, um, we have to require that this coefficient is zero. In other words, no solution exists unless it's zero. So as long as f meets the criterion for existence of a solution, in other words, it would be an ill-posed problem if I didn't have this, then I'm good. So, so what appeared to be an issue is actually not. But you have to, be, you have to check these things. <clears throat> Any questions about this procedure? So this is what appealed to me about spectral methods when I first learned about them. Uh, I, I learned about this kind of procedure where, uh, this, in my case, it was for time-dependent problems, where we can take a transform, work in frequency space, transform back, and you had such an accurate solution, and all the things that were such a concern for finite difference methods about consistency, stability, etc., were not a problem. They, they were, the issues were taken off the table. It's like, well, I want that. Um, but as I said last time, spectral methods are so narrowly applicable, and that's why I'm trying to do something about it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so all of that is for case of periodic boundary conditions. I don't have as much time left as I would like, but I can at least say something about non-periodic, and then whatever's left I'll just uh, do on Monday. Now, uh, so I should mention that a function of this form, in other words, it can be expressed in the Fourier series, um, so the combination of e to the i k x, it's called a trigonometric polynomial. Um, the reason for that name is because when we think of polynomial, you think you have a function of x that consists of terms of or that are powers of x. And we don't have that here, but I can write this as e to the i k, or sorry, e to the i x. Raised to the k power. 
So, um, so instead of being a polynomial in x, it's a polynomial in e to the i x. So that's what. And what is e to the i x? That is cosine x plus i sine x, all raised to k power. Um, so, so that's why it's called a trigonometric polynomial. Um, but these are periodic. So if we have a PDE whose boundary conditions are not periodic, these polynomials um, instead of using these, what we could do instead is use Ordinary, also referred to as algebraic, uh, polynomials. So polynomials in X. Um, but we have to be careful about that. Um, and actually, I was just, because of something I was recently covering in 560. Um, so... The idea is um, we represent u of x, we approximate u of x by um, okay. as a linear combination of polynomials, and these are called the Grange polynomials. Um, and these play the role of the delta function uh, from before, uh, because each Lagrange polynomial evaluated at a certain point in your grid is equal to 1 if i is equal to j, and 0 if i is not equal to j. So we have these functions, like before, that are 1 at a certain point and 0 at all other points. Um, and we use those functions to represent u, uh, the solution of our PDE. So therefore, the derivative at a certain point is a combination of u values again. And we take the derivatives of the Lagrange polynomials um, and plug in the point at which we um, uh, want the derivative. Actually, I'm going to make a generic index. Um, xi. So, so now what that means is we again have a differentiation matrix and we, now we have some idea of what the entries are. They're just these values of Lagrange polynomials derivative. So before, the entries of our differentiation matrix were derivatives of the delta function um, at a certain point. Now it's the derivatives of Lagrange polynomials at a certain point, um, where delta function and Lagrange polynomials have the same values um, at whatever grid points you're using. Okay. <clears throat> but here's where we have to be careful about how we do polynomial approximation. Or really what we have here is polynomial interpolation. Um,
because often we're going to be using a large number of points. So unlike before, in the periodic case, we should not choose the points xj to be equally spaced. Um, and in the periodic case of trigonometric polynomials, that's perfectly fine, but not here. Um, and there's a famous example that I was recently covering in 560, Runge's example. Function 1 over 1 plus x squared. Um, so if you fit that function with a high degree polynomial at, select, at equally spaced points, that polynomial is a terrible approximation of this function. Um, so high degree equally spaced points is bad. Um, instead, Um, now here I'm working on the interval minus 1 to 1, but we can always scale and shift if we're using a different interval. We use the Chebyshev points. So these points are equal to uh, cosine. Of, oh, okay. Um, pi j over n, j equals 0, 1, 2, uh, up to n. Um, now, um, of course, Sarah's just been seeing these points in 560. And I want to prevent some confusion before it starts, because that does not look like the formula I showed you in 560. Right? And there's a cosine, but that's about, and a pi, but that's about it. The uh, reason why is, in 560, the Chebyshev points refer to the roots of Chebyshev polynomial that are in the open interval minus 1 to 1. These are not the roots. They're the extrema. Because of uh, because um, Chebyshev polynomials are a cosine that's going between minus 1 and 1. Um, and these go from minus 1 to 1 inclusive. Um, so. People use both sets of points for interpolation. Um, and they have similar properties. Um, so, because what you're doing is, you look at our top half of the unit circle, these angles will go from 0 to pi. And the angles are equally spaced. I'll try to draw these equally spaced. It's not going so well. Um, And then we draw a vertical line down to the x-axis. Even though my picture is not very good, um, what we can see a little bit, ideally should have used more points. The points are clustered near the boundary. So they're not equally spaced. You have a higher density of points near the boundaries, which is where the error gets worst in the equally spaced case. So by having more points near the boundaries, that drastically reduces that error um, in the approximation. <clears throat> OK. Um, <coughs> now, um, so the idea is, when you have non-periodic boundary conditions, um, you can structure differentiation matrix in a similar way as in the periodic case that you form your Lagrange polynomials for those Chebyshev points, and then you take the derivatives of Lagrange polynomials um, and evaluate them at xi. So I can write down what the um, differentiation matrix is. How much time? To, okay. So 
We're using these temperature points instead of equally spaced. Um, we have u prime, so the approximations of a derivative are equal to a differentiation matrix times your values of u, just like before, just like a periodic case. It's just going to be a very different matrix. Um, so dij, as I wrote down before, is the derivative of Lagrange polynomial number j evaluated at xi, where each Lagrange polynomial is equal to 1 times uh, equals j, 0 otherwise. Um, and in, so in the case of Chebyshev points, I can write down formulas uh, for these matrix entries. Um, so for on the diagonal, so I is equal to J, we have a sum, K not equal to J, of 1 over xj minus xk. Um, and then um, the off diagonal entries, what we have is a product over k not equal to j of, oh, sorry, k not equal to i of uh, xi minus xk over the product k not equal to j of xj minus xk. And all of that is times xi minus xj. <clears throat> Um, well, at least it didn't use trig functions. Um, and I'm not going to derive these because, oh my god, um, <laughs> but uh, I will give you an idea of where these formulas come from. Um, from the actual formula for the Lagrange polynomial. So it's a product for k not, k, so k equals 0 to n. Actually, all of these go, go from 0 to n, but skipping the appropriate index. k not equal to j of uh, x minus xk over xj minus xk. Um, so, because if I plug in, if I plug in x equal xj, all these factors become 1. Yeah, we, the numerators and denominators cancel. Um, if I plug in x equal xi, where i is not equal to j, one of these is going to become 0. So it makes the whole thing 0. So that's how Lagrange polynomials are designed to satisfy these conditions. Um, so Taking the derivative of this, which would be an exhaustive product rule exercise, and then plugging in x equal to xi, um, these formulas, after some sadistic algebra, would fall out. Um, OK. And um, it turns out, though, that um, it's not necessary to actually code up these formulas to get the uh, matrix entries. Um, OK. Well, I have two minutes left. But um, there are formulas for the entries. Because uh, um, this part here is actually not specific to the Chebyshev points. This, these are the formulas no matter what interpolation points you use. But if they are Chebyshev points, 
So on page 25 of the notes, for Chebyshev case, um, these have been worked out. And honestly, I have no idea how. <laughs> Um, and something I'm slightly embarrassed about. I, I haven't seen the paper where they've been worked out. Some, I, some of them I do see where they come from, but um, in general, it's like, because mm. you have to use the, uh, the fact that these x's are cosines of certain angles that are equally spaced. So a difference of cosines, that can be rewritten using a trig identity. And I imagine the approach, that, that, that approach is used, that a lot of trig identities are used to arrive at these formulas, even though no trig functions actually appear in the final result. Um, but later, when you get to homework problems involving uh, this differentiation matrix, it's these formulas uh, that are in the notes that you would use to code up the uh, fill in the entries of a matrix to use in uh, MATLAB. Um, and then you can, if you want to um, work with a second derivative, then you can square that matrix. Um, in MATLAB and just uh, use that. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, out of time. I have a little more on Chebyshev, say like just some examples, but I'll just do that on Monday. I really did that. Did you move that xi minus xj to the denominator? Um, wait. Or was that already there? This? Yeah. Yeah, it's already there. Uh, yeah, I moved it to the denominator. It's been there the whole time. It's multiplied only by the bottom part, though? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it lives in the denominator. 